guys. Welcome again. This is a brilliant talk tonight because this is an area that I really, really wanted to cover. A lot of people talking to me as well about tonight. We've got uh, two professionals in both areas of hemp production, uh, cannabis processing, hemp. It's all cannabis and hemp. So, and we have two brilliant people who are growing in a place in, in, the, in the world that's, you know, I originally, I would have thought you can't grow cannabis there, can you? Because it's down on the, on the west hand, the west side of the, the Atlantic, uh, Wild Atlantic Way is called that for exactly that reason. It's pretty wild and it's Atlantic down there. That's so sure. it's, um, it's something that uh, I desperately wanted to get into and get under the hood with the two people that are doing it so successfully and have such incredibly interesting projects down there. So I want to welcome everybody, drum, drum roll. Welcome, please, the people from Wild Atlantic Hemp. And uh, it's uh, Daniel and Laura, beautiful Laura. And, uh, you know, guys, welcome to my show, I guess. <laughs> Thanks very much. It was a great Thanks introduction. <laughs> Let, yeah, so we've got so much to cover with you guys. That's yeah. how I feel because it's super interesting. You've got people uh, really interested in hemp. I've, I've been talking in the past with Chris Allen and uh, the, the people, I know people involved in hemp federations in Scotland and Northern Ireland and everything. And yeah. so this is uh, something very interesting. So I'm going to push to that, that side of your, your business first, which is, and it's, you have a project in on Loop Head. We're all staying, staying in County Clare, but uh, yeah. Loop Head, tell, can you tell me a bit about it? Yeah, well, sure. I suppose it started kind of um, a couple of years ago because we have a really good friend who is a soil scientist and Daniel was doing, like, so Daniel fertilizes the soil um, using biochar, microbial teas, um worm casting, worm casting that kind of that's... seaweed extracts from the from what's around us basically you know so i was making up our own microbial teas <sighs> with, a, with a biochar mix that we had our own pit we we're making a bit of biochar and i'd done a bit of a, an experiment plot where we put no amendment and we put in our own organic amendment with the biochar and she was over and she kind of looked and she says what what the hell is going on here she said these these plants over here are about a foot tall and the ones beside it then all of a sudden they're like six feet tall she said what the hell is going on and she's as i say she's a soil scientist so yeah. that piqued her interest straight away so that's oh. that was where the beginning of the the project all started really i think so and then what also happened at around the same time was our local community group wanted were kind of asking us did we have any ideas for a kind of a community biodiversity project and so we said it would be really interesting to look at soil so they kind of came together we there was a, it was a an, um, department of agriculture uh, funded project but it was a, a european innovation partnership so but with the information from our friend the soil scientist kate randall and um and what our own research we put together an application and put it forward for the project was for 10 farmers to grow hemp on loop head using these natural amendments to see if we could show that there was improvement in um, the soil health but also in the above ground productivity wow hmm. and uh, this all fits in with this great this much lauded great european green new deal uh, scenario so is the so we the actually project threw a lot on that whole green new hmm. deal um in the application it really tied in the whole um i suppose the ethos of what the green new deal is about Sure. We looked at carbon sequestration um, mm. uh, was another big element. And we, we kind of tied in a few different elements of what, what what's coming down the line for farmers. We wanted it to be something that local farmers could would benefit from, as well as from the soil point of view, that there could be financial benefit for them as well. Sure. And uh, um no, it's. I think it's an it's an incredibly interesting project, and this uh this whole uh, idea of the soil, uh, the soil, and rejuvenating the soil because soil is. I read there's a I read a statistic like eighty percent of the soil in the world is 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 it destroyed, be, you know? depleted. Like so, that, so that's we we started our soil when we started. It would have been used over years for pasture and fertilizers and whatnot would have gone on it. And it was like clay doby soil. It was terrible soil, to be honest, when we started with it. And I said, as you said, how am I going to get anything to grow with this? So over like over a bit of time, we started putting in that biochar and putting in those microbes into it. So we kind of brought the soil back to life. So it's, it's about protecting the soil is what we're, our ethos is as well. And minding our soil and looking after the soil. Because if you look after the soil, the soil will look after you with the returns it'll give you, you know. And I suppose to jump into it, we what we did was we on the ten farms that were part of the project, 
the, the plant that we chose to grow was hemp and um so it was it was a big kind of a, a new thing for, a new new crop mm, for a little our bit community. taboo i suppose as well yeah. at the start so know? it was really good for us from a point of view of we were the only people growing hemp and i suppose our business was kind of just starting off and it was a very very new idea and it was a way that that it brought the whole community into the idea and they all we had farm walks and we had project you know we could show community members what could be made from hemp and then the whole idea of hemp being a carbon sink sequestering a huge amount of carbon mm. um and the fact that you could potentially make biochar from the, the hemp it, it kind of just excited a lot of people and it got people thinking about i suppose regenerative farming yeah where we only we did a little project as well with some of the the byproduct from the stalks we actually turned it into biochar as well to see could we look at a kind of a, a circular economy with the product as well and then what you're doing is once you've turned that into a carbon you can use that as your fertilizer and you can put that back into the ground and then you've actually sequestered carbon back into the ground and improved improved your soil at the same time and would you see this as being a kind of thing across Ireland? Like, so all the soils are badly depleted because we are kind of very mono, mono agriculture. I would have seen in, you know, it's a lot of grazing just all over and intensively as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's around the salts, the fertilizers. That was it's the, the heavy salts, yeah. And the, gly the glyphosate has been a big problem as well, because when they put glyphosate, the likes of Roundups and things like that onto the ground, it basically kills your whole uh, microbial um, and the mycelium inside in the ground and your, and your microbes. So that all that, that soil food web gets destroyed. And if you don't use your heavy fertilizers next year in it, nothing's going to grow in it because basically all of the life has been depleted in it from using those chemicals on the ground. So it's kind of a bit of a catch-22 with farmers then. They think, sure, if I don't put something on it, there's nothing's going to grow. So they're, 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 you know, in, in that sense. That was another part of why we chose hemp as well, because we wanted to see if we could show that because um, hemp is phytoremedial, it can right. draw like heavy metals and we wanted to see if we could maybe improve the soil health like by removing some of this glyphosate or these heavy so um, soils that were in the soil so that was another aspect of it so it actually the, the whole project um was really really well received and it went on to win a national climate action award as part of the pride of place awards in in Dublin. So we were very proud mm, that the project was, was put brilliant. forward by Clare County Council. Um, and by firstly by Loop Head Together, which is our local community group, Clare County Council put it forward as part of um as like what the yeah, community so it won was undertaking. The National Climate Action Award for the for the whole country, the whole country. Based, basically. North so and yeah, South. No, fantastic. My own brother, my own brother is uh, picked up one of those one of those circular economy awards up there. Very uh, good. Yeah, he has a, he's got a company called Sirtex in mm -hmm. in longford which are basically he's recycling all mattresses right, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and turns it into a, into a into a, into a rolls of uh, of um kind of roll you it's used in all sorts of places like in arenas horse arenas and yeah. as as a place for horse arenas but again he was at that so he would have been a competitor maybe at <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm delighted that he got trumped by him. I know it was it was a big day because yeah, it was a big day. It, first thing it was Marty Whelan up on stage, and it was all the mayors from all the counties of uh, you know, and all the representatives from all the different counties, and to hear hemp being given this big yeah, award. I, I thought we were going up for a small little kind of a uh, small little ceremony, maybe with thirty or forty people. We arrived there, there was about. 400 people inside in this hall and the round tables and all the mayors from each county i said jesus what's going on here yeah. like you know and the project was called hemp for soil so it had a real hempy name so yeah. uh, so it, it. it was it was kind of a, yeah. a so big day we're definitely starting to break the taboo as well yeah. you know attitudes are changing and people are changing yeah. and they want to know more and more about it to be honest you know yeah and especially for that would you see that as being the kind of uh, a kind of you have to break a lot of stigma particularly in the farming community a little bit more than yeah I farmers are kind of do you know what i mean they're risk averse it's it's a new crop and as, as well a lot of the problem is do you know there's no proper um actually manufacturing places for the likes of the seeds and for the shiv like for like there's no proper decortication um and factories and things like that so it makes it very hard for a farmer to actually think about investing in machinery or in seeds or anything like that when they don't have a definite on where is the crop going to go at the end of it, do you know, that's, that's a massive problem. And there's no real investment coming in line from the government bodies, you know? Yeah. Was one of my, was one of my next questions. Is yeah. there like, uh, because I've been to, uh, I'm in Barcelona, I go, I'm very much in touch with, uh, Barcelona has, um, 
uh, we have a university here devoted to to the to the the, the cannabis plant, and mm. you have proper innovations. It's an innovation center with proper, just like UCD Innovation Center Academy, any of those things, and they have it here devoted to the cannabis plant. There's obviously a whole different attitude to it here. You can grow, uh, everybody can grow five plants, but on a kind of, a, I I was so surprised. And one of the most shocking things, and I was watching a, a guy who was pitching for big money to do processing. And uh, and he, like in his uh, pitch, he was saying that uh, there's only, there is no uh, processing in the whole of Spain, 40 million people. And in a, in a country that can, you know, that they readily grow, mm. you know, uh, cannabis, cannabis and hemp here. And uh, there's still no, there's still no processing. Yeah. So I was going to meet, uh, I was, I'm, I'm meeting, uh, still in the next few weeks, I hope to meet, uh, they're up in a place in, in, uh, beside Girona, Banyoles, uh, a guy that is doing processing uh, here. But it is the big challenge, is it not? Oh, it's it massive, is. it's a massive and, challenge. And to be honest, it's it's not, a, it's, it's about like bringing the farmers to a point where they're producing enough hemp of a certain quality that can be processed through this machinery. And then at the same time, it's a chicken egg situation. Yeah. And then getting the millions that you need to get one of these machines put in place. So if that's it, what he was looking for, he was looking for millions. Millions, millions yes. Millions. And, <laughs> but you I think I remember it was 15 million. <laughs> you also have to have farmers that are, you know, or, that can be brought along to grow the hemp and they can't do it on a promise you know yeah. those days are you, you can't do that to people they there has to be a guaranteed yeah. market for it and so it it has to have government support or it has to have so, a huge yeah. funding if you, you mess the farmers just... around the first time and they don't it doesn't go right for them it's you're done do you know it's not going to work yeah. the next time around then you know like when i first started growing when we first started growing hemp a friend told me a story about this other crop now it seems to be getting a resurgence but it's called miscanthus and it was basically a kind of a willow plant and all the farmers were encouraged to grow as much miscanthus as they could possibly grow guaranteed they were told there was definitely going to be a market for it in burners the market never materialized and so many farmers got left in in debt because of the situation and you you realize very quickly why farmers are risk averse because they're not risk averse yeah, they've, they've just been binged, before, they've been burnt like, before, before. Yeah. so for us it's been a real we want to do this slowly so that no even when farmers come to us ask so can they grow hemp for us or daniel always tells them start small Grow it a small amount the first year. See if you like growing it. See if it grows well in your land. There's never, you know, there's sometimes farmers come to us and say, oh, 20 acres, yeah. we'll grow 20 acres of it. And we know it's worth this much money. And like, you have to be able to harvest it. You have to be able to store it. You have to be able to dry it. So there's all these things that people don't realize are other like big like there's, a, there's a bit of learning to the, to the, such, to the yeah. thing as well. Like people all of a sudden, yeah. you know, I've, I've all of this planted. And I said, well, but what have you organized and where it's going to be dried and have you got containers ready to dry it? And they're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought. and you're like, sure, it's, it, it, you know, the crop is me, it may as well be let it rot into the ground. Do you know that kind yeah, of Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's very easy uh, as activists out here. We, we we can produce all the infographics, like yes. that demonstrate, you know, how many uses, how much <laughs> yeah. for sequestering, all of that magical information, which is not magical, it's real, True. but it is, yeah. uh, it's something that, the scale, the the difficulties that we're talking about there is exactly the difficulty, yeah. 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 So as I say, we tell farmers to start small, grow just a couple of acres, see how you get on with that, see how you harvest that, see how you dry that small bit, see can you sell that bit, and if that all works for you and you like what you're doing, then you invest a pound in it. Do you know that kind of? A we way? went back. Awesome. We went. So when we first started this, we got. We really were so. We wanted to be. You know, as kind of as like have enough knowledge to do this properly so we went back and did our went back to did our master's in agricultural innovation and we back to school we went back to school <laughs> back to school but course, there, is, there yeah. was no cannabis course in ireland so we kind of had to like, shimmy one into <laughs> it work for us so we did this course and we looked at the value chain hmm. of hemp and what we realized is that in ireland for it to work you have to be able to realize everything the value from every single part of the plant and the part that has the highest value is the flower. And then after that, you're working your way down. And the economies make sense for seed and fiber when you have got the value from the flower. So from the flower, from the flower. So unless mm. you can, 
you know, realize the value of the whole plant, then the economies aren't there for the fiber, especially in a small country like Ireland. So it has to sure. be, the whole process has to be encapsulated into, and you know, you need a lot of funding from the government to get the whole industry up and running, but cottage industries can process the seed. Mm. And, you know, we obviously were still in that gray area with the flower, but, um, you know, and then then fiber can be realized for a shiv and for building. But up until, yeah. until farmers can make the money from the top part, it's much harder to make money from the rest. Right. So it's it's really um, it requires like a, a proper investment uh, nationally mm. to to bring Absolutely. it, to, yeah. Bring yeah. it yeah. forward. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, but I mean, you're you are. I notice in your kind of in the the wording on your website and stuff, you call it an experiment. And uh, so, you, have you got have you got? Did you get the twelve the twelve farmers? Oh, so for the, for, for the, for yeah, for the, uh, hemp for soil. So that project's actually finished. So we had the 10 farmers, um, mm. they grew hemp. We, we did soil testing. Yeah. At the very start, we got a baseline for all the farms. We got each farm was a different type of soil type, um, but all on the loop head peninsula. So it's a very small peninsula with the Shannon on one side and the Atlantic on the other. So it's very much wild, as you say. Um, so, so we had a da dairy farmers, we had alpaca farmers, we had, um, um, what else are we, I suppose we had beef, like, beef farmers, beef farmers well, as well, yeah. so, so beef, and dairy, like beef and dairy, which would be predominantly what we have here, and um, yeah, so it grew really well in some places, some places it didn't grow very well, um, but we, we harvested it, and um, we have the soil, the soil assessments mm. are back now, so we've, it's a one-year project, so we, unfortunately, we don't get to see we don't see massive improvements. Yeah. But what one of the things that we did see was because we plowed, so it was a regenerative farming practice farm, but um, we did plow the land because the land is very much a clay yeah, soil. So it has to be kind of plowed. So yeah. we 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 put biochar into some of the land, and what we did see was this carbon that was released in plowing was in the farms that had biochar put back in it kind offset of maintained the same amount of carbon level so it offset the, the carbon lost from from plowing and we saw some movements in kind of microbial life you know mm. some improvements but a project like that needs three years at a minimum mm. so that's Maybe. what we're working on at the moment but, but you could see on the above ground where you had the plots with the oh, biochar yeah. and the nutrients they, they were much larger plants they were much healthier plants and you had bigger flowers so it, you know what I mean? It's the, the, yeah, results, it was obvious. the results showed it. You could see it. Just what the hell is going on over here? You said this. Yeah. this we, and you do us right away. That's where we put the stuff. Do you know? That's, yeah, that's, 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 you know. Yeah. yeah. So actually, the data that came from it has been put into another project. So that hopefully is it's a European project. So hopefully that you get funded, and that's from a much bigger, from a longer frame, period, yeah. and from you a much bigger area. Over longer, longer now it might period. not be hemp per se, but it look at the soil health and biochar. So right. And so, um, so in terms of other parts of the country, is there, uh, um, where, where can it go? This, like, could this project be created elsewhere or? It could be replicated elsewhere. Yeah, it was. Um, we were looking at trying to do it in Europe with other places. Yeah, we did. We looked at it for a while. We looked at it even just, we looked at Spain, Finland and Ireland and doing this, replicating the same project in the different kind of uh, so it's latitudes climate zones, and climate yeah. zones right and, see, and so actually out of the project i did go to um spain to grow hemp for uh, in uh, well, last year last year and um, to grow a little bit of hemp to see if it grew because of the different desertification that's going on in the south of spain um, it's very bad huh? it's very yeah. bad and uh, not not just the south i'm in catalonia and catalonia we're, we're already in um, uh, talking about uh, import importing water yeah. So this is a, this is an issue. I go I go to a, I'm part of a, a thing that has talks on on the problems in the Mediterranean and the problems of uh, the water is the biggest the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Olive oil olive oil has gone through the roof, and uh, I mean you're at the end of the the the, the supply chains in that regard. So I don't yeah. know what the I don't know what the price is of olive oil in there, but something that everybody took for granted in the Mediterranean diet is yeah. now a proper luxury. I mean, it yeah. just, it's, it's gone like from three euros for a, a liter to, you wouldn't get well, a liter for under 11 euros now for a-, a Wow. A, a, yeah, I'm not sure. I was looking at it in America the other day, proper oil, olive oil was like 30 or $40 a liter is what they were charging for in America. That's what's going and on. that was what, it was yeah. actually, it was an it's old- a, You're at the end of the supply chains. Yeah. That's it was what actually, 
it was an old olive, um, like a 150 year old olive. It was like not the way they kind of plant olive trees now, you know, in the much more kind of forward. This was like they had much more space. And what we were doing was growing hemp between the olive trees. And I suppose the hope was that you could kind of save the olive trees and you could have an additional income from maybe the hemp and being a crop that maybe they didn't need as much water. Now we went, we planted it in in June, which was really, really late. I'm sure it was a scorcher last yeah, year, scorcher. as well, it was roasted out of it. Like. It could have been, probably, <laughs> if it was planted in February, you might have done much better. Yeah, anyway, but it's, uh, there are parallels, uh, and this uh, climate change is real mm. everywhere, and uh, so there's a, a but the, these things can help. I mean, the likes of uh, these kinds of crops and changing our ag agriculture has to be changed, is what, yeah. I, is what I think, you know? And but we uh, definitely would work with more farmers if groups of farmers, and we do already, Daniel does a lot of kind of work with farmers who are interested in growing hemp, but we generally kind of work with people who come together in little groups of farmers to kind of see, to, you know, help give this information that we've gathered about yeah. how it's best to grow it. Um, what you know varieties are best for their conditions so the way so we kind of all set up the hemp cooperative back in 2018 wasn't it yeah. so a group of us got together and we set up that organization and we've, we've got 150 of us strong now we right. all share our information they, they they that body gets the seeds for us we shall have all the correct paperwork they'll help you with getting the the license application the license. yeah so it makes everything a bit sm smoother and flow smoother for everybody so everybody's there to kind of get on board and help each other so this is what i did last year so here is here's you know what i mean here's the information now and it just makes things so much easier for people you know yeah that's great and uh because there are it feels like there's nodes <laughs> all around the country so like cabin there's there's guys growing up in cabin and there's guys growing over in, in wicklow and the, yeah. uh, the is it the banner uh, well the we, banner. We, have, we have people growing in um cork for us we have people growing in waterford for, for us we have people growing up in um up in Kildare for us, We're pretty much kind of across the country, people in Clare growing for us, because that what we do, what we do then as well, we, they, some of those people will grow themselves and we'll bring in the, the product and we'll process it and actually make an oil for them as well, which where they would have grown their own product. So we'd right. have different people around the country as well that we'd make oil for as well, you know? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's what it's really got to be about, you know, you mm. know that they're bringing all, all these farms together into uh, one uh, channel of processing and uh, before it can kind of get to the, the big level. Yeah, like my brother, the, the, I mean, the machines that he needs to, uh, to chomp up all the, the mattresses mm. to make his, to make his uh, product is, um, they're massive machines yeah. and they are, yeah. they're huge, and they're huge investments just for, you know, you're not buying, you're not going to get discount on, on, you're not going to buy one on Black Friday, you know, it's not, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> they're not that kind of uh, equipment. <laughs> It's a, I think it's an amazing project. I think it's brilliant. And I think it's uh, fantastic that you're too young, bright, well-educated. And that's what I'm finding is that within this uh, uh, cannabis hemp scene in Ireland, there's, uh, there's a lot of well-educated people who know exactly what they're doing. And uh, uh, I think it gives Ireland a real uh, possibilities. What yeah. do you think about uh, uh, the future? People want the product. So they right. do this. And the, and the thing is, there was, so, there was so much crap being brought into the country before, and it was poor quality product, and people want a genuine Irish product, so they do, that's good quality, that's a full spectrum, so the, the people want it, so there's absolute potential for it there as well, for, for a, a, budding, a budding business in Ireland, really, to be honest, right. but it's not no. easy, it's difficult, it is difficult, yeah. do you know what I mean, there's a lot of steps put against you, you're not allowed to advertise on Facebook or Instagram. Well, hold on, so, hold on. so now we're moving into the kind of your your the CBD world, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. the and the derivatives of uh, that like that's that because you're saying that that's the, the flower is the most most valuable part of the, of the plant, mm -hmm. and there's all those restrictions. So what kind like what are the restrictions? Just so the people out there can realize. So as I say, it's. It, the, the, the restrictions are basically uh, like for, for transportation is difficult in the country. So, you'd, you know, you'd have to go into the guards, you'd have to get your form stamped, all of this sort of thing. The movement of the product around the country is restricted. So you're also, as I suppose, but the, on, the, on the one hand, then we are actually supported fairly well by the Food Safety Authority in Ireland, which is actually quite good because what was what, what they were stopping is, let's say, the... Um, it was CO2 extracted, the, the Novel Food Act, 
was what was going right. on there. So that's what basically all the products that were coming into Ireland were under the novel food act. They're all extracted with CO2 or ethanol or so on. Whereas the Food Safety Authority, we, we went and talked to them ourselves and said, this is what we want to do. We're trying to set up a company. But they said, look, you can't use those components because that we, we, we researched that and looked at that at CO2 machines, all that sort of thing. They said, no, you can't use any of that. So you'll have to come up with an extraction method yourselves, but you're not allowed to use solvents. So they said you can use aqueous, you can use heat, you can use pressure. So within, under all of these terminologies, as I said, we went back and did the masters and we were kind of looking and saying, how can we figure this out without doing without using like solvents and CO2, which, which to be honest, we didn't really want to be using either. Do you know, you're after growing this organic, lovely product. And the last thing you want to be doing is throwing solvents down on top of it. So of we managed to figure out how to do a solvent-free extraction or like a mechanical extraction using heat and pressure and stuff like that. We went, we looked at a bit at the cold pressing, but we said, look, cold pressing didn't work for us. So we learned a different method of extraction that worked really, really well for us. Yeah. So it did. And we, we managed to put this forward to the Food Safety Authority Ireland, and they approved our extraction method. So they did. And that's the point wow. I was like, and I think that's what dif differentiates us from and like if you don't have if you if you're not cold pressing or if you're not if you don't have a solventless extraction process, you're considered novel in Ireland. And so like if you're if you don't have a CO2 extractor, if you if you're using CO2 or ethanol, basically, which was kind of the industry standard for extraction. Um yeah. and that's what a lot of the businesses that come into the industry want to do and to be honest it's what we we, we were we kind of set up we were thinking we'll start off with an ethanol extraction mm. and then when we can afford it we will buy a co2 extractor and that's that was our business plan that's what we went to the food right. safety authority with at the start this is our game plan and so we went to the hsc with mm. at the start that's the other part of that's the difficulty so when we started there was no place no to go no to talk to, to somebody well, you had no, to talk to the Department of Health. You had to, to get to the Department of Health. You had to go to the Health Product Regulatory Authority for your license. That in itself was a process. And then once you, you once you had got you had harvested and produced a product, it was no longer the Department of Health's issue. It was became the food food safety mm. authorities. You know, so the HSE and the Food Safety Authority and the Environmental Health Office. So then we had to get a, a facility <laughs> that was because we didn't want to be medical because you know medical and food are two different um two to two different standards. We we wanted to be food standard because we knew we wanted it to be a, something that local farmers could grow and that we could process and we wanted it to be a food product and it could be accessible to everybody where if it was a under a medicine it would be a prescription for people and be a very limited product for people to be able to access sure. so we were like okay then we went to con we, we got a facility we contacted the hsc they sent out their the health inspector to and she stood there in front of us and said cannabis not on my watch not no way yeah. as she left i'd say she ran out the door and we thought okay after yeah. we were in a roadblock <laughs> two years in at that stage and we're like oh no another kind of like this is not going to work and so another barrier of hurdles and constant, constant obstacles hurdles. and you're always trying to figure out who's your boss and who can we talk who to next talk to and then we we contacted this guy in the food safety authority dr pat mahoney and we we went through everything about our process with him and he kind of walked us through what was going on with the novel food. Now, Ireland has taken a very different stance on the Novel Food Act than a lot of other European places. And sure. Pat Magny has been on the Novel Food Board in Europe for 20 years. So he's seen the changes and he hasn't kind of accepted a lot of those changes that have had. So he, not that he was pro-cannabis, but he's pro the rules uh, as he saw them. And so we were able to find a kind of gap that we could mm. fit into to make our product a food product. And once all those steps have been, and we were three years in the state, when we had the product produced, we at that stage, we still didn't know if the product was going to be accepted by people in the sense that would it help? Would people find it beneficial? Is it going to be a good product? Is it a well? good product? It, if people buy it, will they buy it a second time? Because we would have had loads of support the first product. Yes, first people while. would have bought the first product. But if you don't have return business, then so you're goosed. You're goosed. <laughs> so we were four years, I'd say, before we kind of relaxed and realized, hang on, people are buying. People would buy the 10 mil bottle and then they'd come back for the 30 mil bottle the next time. And once that started happening, we were like, oh, yeah, it's done. We've done yeah. 
we've made a project and people are using it. And the thing really about our there. process as well, as I say, a lot of time when it goes through the CO2 extractor machines and all of that, let's say all the product that was coming in, they would have extracted the THC and removed it completely from the product. So it wasn't properly a full spectrum anymore. And the thing right. is, unless you have, a, as the plant is represented, unless you have all the different compounds in it, it just doesn't seem to work. Whereas all the products that were coming into the country were basically isolates in a bottle. And they were having mm -hmm. to take very large quantities of this product to get the same results you would have to do to take with our bottle as well. So we weren't sure thinking just how can we even compete with all of these products in the market? Whereas now I can, we can stand over our product and say, yeah, it's one of the best out there, you know? Oh, I forgot yeah. that was one of the biggest ones. Yeah, when because when we finally had the product, obviously because it's a natural product and it's an, a natural extraction, there was THC present because there's, there's naturally THC in hemp. So, and um, that was another legal issue because obviously under the Misuse of Drugs Act, there's, there's no, no THC. THC. Level, per se. So, Ireland is unforgiving. That's the, like, I mean, why? This is it. They consider, they consider the THC a contaminant. So they allow a certain amount of contaminant in the bottle. So over in Europe, they went to the European acute reference dose, which was 70 UGs of THC a day for, as, let's say, they took the average person as 70 kgs. Whereas Dr. Pat Amani actually went to look, he said, no, we're all about 100 kgs in Ireland. So we were actually giving a leeway of another 30 uh, UGs. We were allowed to recommend up to 100 UGs of THC a day. Now, we're only allowed to recommend one drop of day to, of the recommended daily dose. But he was actually able to give us that leeway to actually be able to bring the product out on the market with THC in it. Yeah, wow. which, was, and that's, which is great. So, so, so yeah. there is stuff in the background and there is help with Ireland. It's just the politicians haven't maybe got to that level yet. But I think things are changing, but they are very slow. Yeah. And slow, our health yeah. inspector is now like she comes to visit us once every like six months, maybe more. Mm. She rings quite a few times. Great relationship with her. Yeah, and we, we, she she, really she, helps. I'll give her a bottle. She'll bring it into the public analytic labs in Ireland and she'll get it tested there. So we're constantly working over and back, knowing exactly what are the limits, what are the levels, what's the right labeling, all of this. So we kind of work together and we're kind of write the rule book at the same time at the moment because they don't they don't know either. They don't know this is all new to them as well. But at the same sure. time, if you work with them, they will work back with you. But you, as long as you do your work and you know your stuff and you, and you have the things done for them that they ask you to do, you know. Yeah. And it is such an important, uh, because right, the plant is complicated, there's no doubt about it, it's a complex, the entire area of anything happening medicinally with it is complex, yeah. and uh, while we have a, we all have an endocannabinoid system that nobody, that no doctor is actually learns about in school, but uh, you know, these cannabinoids act, and I, I'm a great believer in the terps. And uh, the oh, terpenes, and, and I mean, you can just, you can find out what terps do by I've, I've got lavender plants outside. You stick your head, you stick your head in a bowl of lavender, and you know that uh, that that has a calming. That's mm. what. And, and, and I say the, the amazing thing about the cannabis plant is with the terpenes, the, the the cannabis plant is able to mimic all of those other plants. You say it's the lavender cult, which is lavanol, which the, the, which creates a terpene in the plant. You've myrcene, which comes from mangoes, lemonine, lem do you know what I mean? So basically, the cannabis cannabis plant can mimic any other plant in nature, which is kind of you know mind-boggling sometimes really it truly is and it's uh, it makes it and um, people do call it the god plant in that kind of sense because it because it it, it crosses so many uh, of these barriers on its own the plant actually does itself mm -hmm. and it's like that thing it's like if anybody wants to know what the what terps do i mean that's it stick your head in, in a in a, in a bowl, walk through a lavender a field of lavender yeah, and it'll calm you down straight away you know yes it <laughs> calm you down straight away. So yeah, but so uh, so having a full full spectrum is ultimately important. important. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. No, we have it. Look, we have it is full spectrum product, and you know, and there's there's nothing taken out. There's nothing added. Yeah, it's just the plant, basically. You know, that's in the bottle. Yeah. So we have a lot of uh, uh, we have a few court cases going on in with with Irish kind of CBD sellers shops. Different. Hmm. I don't know. I think there's five, last I heard there was like five different cases active yeah. in some somewhere in the system. And uh, um, do you have do you have a fear of that kind of uh, illegality? Constantly, you're always looking over your shoulder in this industry. It's quite a stressful. You don't know could the rug be pulled out for you at any minute. So yeah, it's a very stressful industry to be honest. To be honest, you're 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 taking a big risk. Uh, like most, like you know, uh, nine out of ten businesses fail. As I say, how many cannabis businesses actually works? You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're kind of yeah. taking, you're taking a big risk. So you are always fearful. 
who's going to come in the door and tell you not you can't do it anymore it's all done and dusted so yeah it's it's, it's very stressful industry it's, in that sense as well it's like, the, it's I like think... the farmer getting locked up for tb no but i'm just saying there's there's a comparable there in the sense that a, a guy gets locked down uh because he, he gets caught with that tb animals he doesn't get caught the yeah. the the animals are on his farm and uh, that's that's his livelihood so suddenly gone like that mm. and so there uh, like you say there's a reason that farmers are risk adverse understandably there's a yeah. and so adding adding extra uh risks is not yeah. obviously not going to be an easy sell for for the no it was definitely not an easy it was definitely like I sometimes think what possessed us to think just, that we could get this far. Yeah, if you put all the steps out in front of us now and said, these are all the things you've got to do to get this business up and running, you went, nah, that's impossible. That's what yeah. you would have said. I, that, no one's going to do that. There was a level of delusion that was <laughs> just... And like, to be honest, we wouldn't start until we... We, we got all the approval as well. Yeah, we, I, couldn't, I couldn't start. Like I couldn't have started until, you know... The HPA, we had the license, you know, we had the, the OK from the HSC with the OK from the FSAI. Do you know, it, we're not in the clear, but we're still very much in the grey area. It's still not super clear, but it's it was a safe enough zone for me to start started that I could say, so we OK. We actually have all the documentation to go with it. We have done it. Right. And we have all these, con we, you know, we have four years of, or more now, of conversations back and forth between all these government departments who, See, I I was ridiculously clear from the very start, even from the very first license application. Um, I put in, a, you know, this is our five year plan. Now it was kind of over two or three pages, but it basically said we want to produce CBD from the plants that we create, you know, that we grow. They they had all that information before they issued us the license. They issued us the license, so I knew we were clear there. And again, I did that all the way along. It was always, mm -hmm. you know, this is exactly what we want to do. And they once they gave us the okay to do it. That was kind of, you know, I kind of was like, that's, you know, yeah. so and much. I, yeah, and, then, and then going back, going back to school to kind of to go, you know, and get get down into knowing exactly what's what's happening here and what is possible. Yeah, mm. I find I find it you're a, you're a very admirable, inspiring story on just on your on your own. This this uh, and the and that basic idea that you how can you grow how can you grow hemp on the wild Atlantic way. <laughs> <laughs> It's almost an absurdity sometimes. Isn't it? Yeah, when I see the weather. We'll you a few pictures of some of the crops, so we must. Yeah, we definitely send yeah. pictures. Yeah. Yeah. They look well, as, the, as the storms are arriving, and now we have the now we have the the we're actually naming them now. You know, they're all Brendans and Gronias and uh, whatever Ifas and whatever they are. But um, it is a it's a remarkable. It's not a remarkable, but it's uh, your perseverance. And that's like the one thing you say about the storms. The particular um, strain that we're growing there at the at the moment moment is called Fenola, which yeah. is actually um it's a derivative of a Russian strain, Ruta radlis. So it's actually an auto flower. So you can actually plant that in May and actually have it harvested by August, where you don't have to worry about going into September, October, where the storms would normally come and destroy a crop in you. So you can actually right. get this crop within to three to four months. You can have it in and in and out basically, which is a great, great thing about Perfect. it. And and you're getting it where all the where all the flower and the sunshine is there in your August. So it's hiring at an optimal time for your flowers, you know. So it's it's a great strain to actually grow for, for for for. Um, yeah, for you, you I know? hear I hear a lot about that. And uh, the another thing is the um, there's there's new stuff beginning to appear about the natural pesticides uh, that are uh, happening coming out of the the hemp product at the hemp crop at the moment. Is that a thing? Is that a feature in your the pesticides is one thing that we haven't had to worry about here on the wild Atlantic hemp because a lot of the time when you're getting pests, it's when you have a crop that's very still, there's no wind and stuff right. like that, where the insects get a chance to land on it and mate. Whereas, to be honest, we have not really had any problems with uh, with, with the pests in our plant. Now, the biggest problem that we might have is a, a thing called bistritis. It's the mold in a plant. So if you're coming to when your plants are fully in flower, and let's say you have got a terrible August and it's just going to rain for you, that you yeah. need to know a lot about your plant. You need to know exactly that window, when it's ready to harvest, because if you let it go four or five days after the window of harvest, the whole thing could go to mold in you. So you really need to know your plant and know what bistritis is and know when to attack and get it up get the crop in and get it dried and get observed and saved basically you know yeah so pests not so much but uh bistritis a fungus attacks yes that's where we do have a problem 
Ah, it's great. Look at for me, it's great to see you have you obviously have a great grow for the um whether you've it's been born out of all the risk inversion in the beginning <laughs> and the, the countering all the barriers. I mean, the barriers are are in so many areas in this whole world of uh, cannabis and hemp and everything. It's just it feels like it's a, it's impossible. And when you get into the like my world is a little bit the the medical uh, patient end of things, and there's some out, outrageous barriers we have with the medical mm. industry just the, our doctors and uh, people who just won't accept uh, what is now, you know, there's there's so many uh, info coming from or inputs coming from everywhere on the planet that where it's been legalized for X amount of time. And when are we going to make this paradigm shift shift to move move past all the all these kind of simple questions that are there filled with studies and oh, the, you know, the body of evidence is there at this stage, to be honest, it just needs to be read. Exactly. <laughs> and taught in schools. And yeah. uh, and that's I think that's a, it was a one uh, I I felt I was I have no impression of the uh, citizens assembly except it felt like a bit of a a bit of a, a, a civil service scam almost they they, they knew the outcome uh, yeah. they went in with the, they yeah. went in with the outcome they wanted and which was nothing no you change talk to the right people to be honest you know. Yeah. Yes, exactly, and uh, and that was across the board in the sense that they did, there was no real patience uh, uh, involved in that citizens assembly, and there was not there was a lot of things missing from it, and there was no positive. Uh, like ninety percent of people are don't have negative uh, people who come back on a uh, weekend and have a couple of joints, whatever they do to relax, and the, it's not an issue. It's not this massive uh, issue that was that gets painted and uh, lost in the negativity around around these uh, these issues. So it's it's still a battle, and I'm just talking. We're on on it because it's complex. It's on many different uh, levels across and lots and lots of different people, and and but the it's stigma. very much that barrier that's there. It's not the population, like it's not the population because the majority of our customers are are kind of so from older. 45, 50 plus is what our basically our, our customer base would be. And that's people that's older people with aches and pains, arthritis, sore knees, gout, stomach problems, sleep issues. So those are the people that are, it's the older generation that are buying the product off us. They, they, their opinion has Absolutely. changed already nearly, so you know, it's, it's really, you wonder who's stopping it because it's like, I, I met a man there yesterday from Boston. He's in his eighties and he was like, cannabis what a non-issue and yeah. he was like I was like it was so refreshing because he was talking to a lot of people who would who still not know really what about much about cannabis but he was very much kind of just saying like why even like why is it why even talking about this still this is ridiculous this is such a it's it's brilliant he should be allowed to consume it it's but, um, but particularly this aging group that you're talking about is like my parents are 80 and 83 and uh, and they actually go I'm a uh, they they go to Fuert, when they started going to Fort Ventura about 10, 10 or twenty years ago, you know they used to go they go they get out of the Irish winter for the and which is what I kind of do as well because I yeah. can't take the, the Irish winter anymore it, it kind of triggers my MS symptoms and all of that kind of thing and they're out in Fort Ventura with a lot of old people out yeah. there Irish people and uh, but and I know people that are there you know they're there because there's clubs on yes. the island you That's know true. and really. yeah. we have we have these irish medical refugees all over spain all over these areas where they can act for for yeah. safe and it's safe access that's the other yeah. thing it's about being able to access something that they're not going to get sick from or they're not going to get uh, uh, some buy something off the black market that's covered in spice or whatever it oh, is yeah. so there's, there's yeah. so many uh, uh, perils involved and in the in having a prohibitionist black market and that kind of scenario. No, I definitely it is. It's kind. Of, it's it's shocking. I thought five when we first started. I said in five years it'll be legal, because <laughs> I suppose we asked this question earlier. But we kind of thought in five years we'll start growing him, and then in yeah. five years it'll be legal and we'll be able to grow cannabis and we'll produce cannabis. And now we've fallen head over heels in love with him. Mm, we love both. We love yeah. both of them. But yeah. it was just, we started off thinking with everything that was going on in the world, we're like, this is five years and this is going to be, this is going to be legal everywhere. And we're, <laughs> yeah. we're definitely over the five-year mark now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I look at it, but, the, but I think that the, there's no excuse anymore for hemp. There are places in, in, uh, in like Italy always had a massive hemp industry uh, historically, mm. and uh, they're coming back there.
I noticed in, I noticed in Belgium as well, there's a lot of, uh, there's hemp companies, you know, involved in, involved in the kind of construction, yes. uh, construction materials. So yeah. they are, it is beginning to, uh, but e, I think the EU needs really to move, move, you know, to get it, get its ass in, in gear. I think and move they are, it. I think they are, I think DG Agri now is, they've, they are pushing hemp. I, I see King Spenner brought out a hemp insulation. The big companies are now Looking moving at, it, at hemp because yeah. their sustainability plans and their sustainability practices, they start, need to start looking at this stuff. And hemp is, is a no brainer for a lot of them. It's yeah. just, yeah, it's that kind of connection between big business and government funding that needs to like jumpstart the processing. And unfortunately, it won't be a cluster of farmers that's that controls the processing, which is what we we always wanted to work towards. That it would be hemp, it would be a you know a cooperative or a kind of a, that would run. How many? How many? There's there's the question there that I, that I really would love to ask is how many how many farmers would it take to justify a, a processor in 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 the island of Ireland, for for hemp fiber, yeah, to have it, how many, how much input? Yeah, these more farmers. acreage that you kind of have to. It's, well, it's acreage, but how many acres would you actually need? But yeah, they say up to five hundred farmers if you want to have a factory going continuously all year round. That you would right. want five hundred farmers growing reason at a hundred acres plus kind of thing, you know. And they'd have to be living. You know, they don't. It, you know, the, the transport of it is a big issue as well because it's light weight material it needs to be easily transported to the location within an hour is kind of a distance yeah so actually time. it's it's long first like long <laughs> exactly right, right, long, right exactly. smack in the middle yeah, of the country is, basically you know, sorted out for everybody that's where it was <laughs> so yeah there's yeah. a lot that's where that's where they and he's but he's he's david my brother the, the yeah. his circular his circular economy business he's run into uh, problems where he, he there's not enough uh, beds there's not enough uh, uh, raw materials for him to yeah. pro not enough for him to process yeah and uh, despite a lot of uh, misinformation that's kind of going down about the ireland's uh, waste management but uh, he's having to go like he has to import uh, uh, to keep that's a bit and that's an issue it's a problem like yeah. you know look that's yeah. the issue i think really where ireland could be do really well in hemp is the seed and you know and the seed and the flower are the same you know they're encapsulated together it's it's about you know you know making industry using the seed and growing enough hemp to that the seed is um that we have in what one. sense is it for for food value or for uh, for, food, for yeah. foods yeah for food. food because look protein is really important and um you know we're going into a more kind of high you know plant-based diets and we're doing we did a, we're working with ucd i think mm. it is on um on you know alternative plant-based plant plant proteins pro yeah so, so we're, we're extracting protein from the seed as well there at the moment so we've two new products coming in the, in the in the new year as well with a protein and fiber and a protein product which is like for your for your health people for your gyms your smoothies that sort of stuff as well it can be added into breads for cakes you know it can be very, very versatile kind of a product and so as an ingredient in ready meals or you know it's it's just it needs to get a kind of a window into a big producer where you're you know adding value to the price of the seed and you know the seed in itself has three product components there's the oil there's the fiber and then there's the protein and then you have the hemp hearts is another one so you have hemp hearts you have hemp milk you know, there is somewhere where inroads could be made um, as a, um, and farmers could, and as Daniel said, it's only three months that it's growing. And so you could be doing something else with that land for the rest of the year. And, you know, hemp is just one of your value streams for your farm. But it's, yeah, look, again, it's still, it's getting over the hurdle of it being hemp and, um, and getting investment for processing. That's, these are the big things. Anyway, so I think that uh, um, you're an inspiring story. Uh, I'll say it again because uh, we need people like yourselves to 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 get the to have the grow for it and to kind of uh, to drive these drive it forward, and uh, eventually we we'll break down different barriers and uh, and we'll get and we'll get there. So uh, maybe maybe it'll take another five years, Laura. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> we're ready for it. <laughs> yeah, I hope you we're stick with it. We're in for the long haul, anyway. So we are. Yeah, and uh, and there's a there's but I think it's like you said I think the population are maybe a little bit ahead of the ahead of everything mm. and ahead, ahead of even the crime and all the rest of it. I mean, I was looking just before I came on here. I was looking at Adon or Reardon in the in the Dáil talking about two and a half thousand people were criminalised this year. That's yeah. I mean that's just that's and you know there's no there's no prisons to put anybody. There's no every one of those every one of those people that are criminalised. You know for 
their the rest of their lives. Their their mm -hmm. lives are destroyed. They're possibly young, 18, 19, whatever. Yeah, it's and, yeah. Yeah, it's what, what's it? Was it like, what's the comedian who said it? It's like the worst thing about um cannabis is being caught with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what can cause you the most trouble. Yeah, that it's going through the, the system. Prohibition, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 So okay, guys, thanks so no, much. Thank and, you really uh, good talking, uh, I won't take any more of your time, your dogs and everything, and uh, and young fellas there to look after. <laughs> and uh, it's been fantastic. Thanks so much. Yeah, great, great talk to you. Really enjoy talking to you. Yeah, and and look at I.